Greetings. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and thank you for joining our online event today. Our principal aim in providing these teleseminars is to offer practical support to the leaders of transition initiatives, those who are considering starting an initiative, and community leaders who are working on resilience building in any aspect within their communities. And we do want to continue to offer the webinars or the teleseminars at no cost and ask that you consider making a donation to TransitionUS.org. So thank you very much if you are able to provide support for us in that way. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce this teleseminar, Seeing Systems. Northwest Earth Institute's model for community building and transformative learning. And in this teleseminar, we have the privilege um, of having with us today Lacey Cagle of Northwest Earth Institute. Um, she's the Director of Learning and Engagement, and she'll facilitate what we're calling a taster session of the Northwest Earth Institute's newest discussion course, which is called Seeing Systems, Peace, Justice, and Sustainability. And Lacey will explain the model that the uh, N NWEI uses to engage people. So I think pay particular attention to that model and to their wealth of discussion guides and courses. And this particular new course, um, is focusing more on social justice, and that's a bit of a departure for them from their previous courses. Uh, so Lacey will explain that too. She'll also talk about some, you know, the systems thinking approach that, um, that the Institute uses in these discussion courses and really helps uh, create a, um, the opportunity for transformative learning. And Lacey, I'm going to leave it to you to talk more about yourself and the Northwesters Institute. And without further ado, just turn it over to you. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Caroline. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you all for joining um, for this teleseminar. Uh, so as Caroline said, I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Northwest Earth Institute. I've been on staff there for um, almost four years, and I've been involved with the in institute um, for six years. Um, I have a master's of science degree in educational leadership and policy with focus on leadership and sustainability education, and I use that degree um, in my job to develop the curriculum that we use in our programs at Northwest Earth Institute. Um, I, when I was in um, when I was in my undergrad, I, I think that was maybe the first time that I, I felt like I really wanted to, care, I wanted to learn about environmental science. I wanted to learn about environmental issues. I wanted to do something, to a, a difference there. But I also really cared about social issues and um, environmental justice, um, the way that, that uh, that we've structured the world and how that affects people as well as the environment. And growing up in the Midwest, um, there weren't really um, many opportunities here to, to see how those were connected or to show that um, the, the solutions that we were looking for should see that those were connected. And so when I first started learning about sustainability when I was in college, that was the first time that it gave me, I had the opportunity to affirm that connection and really start seeing things from a systems perspective. And I'm so happy to be working with Northwest Earth Institute um, and to be able to further that systems thinking through the work that we do. Uh, the, the Northwest Earth Institute was founded in 1993 by Dick and Jean Roy. And we're called the Northwest Earth Institute because um, for the first about 10 years of our existence, we worked exclusively in the Northwest. Um, but for the last 10 years, we started branching out, and now we work throughout the U.S. and Canada. We've had over 150,000 participants um, use our programs, participate in our programs. And we focus on sustainability education and behavior change. And now for us, sustainability education is really so much more 
than just educating people about the problems that we face. It's so much more than knowledge acquisition. Um, the way that we look at sustainability education, it's a holistic perspective, and we're looking at how we um, include people's head, but also people's heart and hands um, in the educational process, uh, helping them feel personally connected to the issues, to see how what's going on in the community and what's going on in the world um, are connected, and their role in those systems and what they can do to make a difference, so they can actually take positive action uh, to make to make change. Behavior change for us, um, there's a big difference between the things that people say they care about, what they think is important, things like uh, recycling or clean air, and the actions they actually take. Um, and for us, behavior change is really trying to bridge that gap between what people say is important to them and what they actually do. We have two different programs that incorporate both of those ideas of sustainability education and behavior change. The first program is our discussion courses. Uh, right now we offer nine different discussion courses on sustainability topics, and those include things like voluntary simplicity, uh, food systems, discovering a sense of place, uh, environmental health, as well as our new course on pe um, seeing systems, peace, justice, and sustainability. Um, and our, their second program is called the Eco Challenge. It is an annual program that runs for two weeks at the end of October. So this is coming up really soon. October 15th is um, the start of the Eco Challenge this year. And it's a free program that anyone can do. Um, we have a website. You can check it out at ecochallenge.org. Uh, people, the, the basic idea of the Eco Challenge is that we, people have ideas of things that they want to change in their life. Um, habits that they, they want to create or habits they want to break, something that's better for themselves, better for their community, better for the planet. Um, and they just need a little extra incentive to be able to make that, to start that change. And so the Eco Challenge gives you a chance every two, for two weeks every year to make the change that you already want to make in the world, um, to do something that's better for you and better for the planet. Um, the Eco Challenge offers uh, incentive. You can create teams. The teams can challenge each other. You get points for checking in, for blogging about your challenge, for recruiting other people, um, and there are raffle prizes. So it's just something that um, makes making that change um, more interesting, more social, and more fun. Those are our two main programs. I wanted to say, I didn't say earlier, this, the discussion course programs are actually designed to be self-facilitated. So if you decide to do a discussion course, it's not something that you have to come to us for us to be able to facilitate for you. We actually have um, discussion course books that you can use in your community in the context that you're in. Um, about 50% of our audience is in higher education communities, so either faculty using our courses or the Eco Challenge in their classrooms, or um, administrators using it for professional development for faculty and staff. Um, the rest of our audience is in different kinds of organizations throughout um, the U.S. and Canada, including faith communities, neighborhood associations, uh, government offices, workplaces, basically anywhere where people are already organized and they're wanting to make a difference, either to learn about sustainability issues or to take action in their own context. So I've told you a little bit about myself and about the Northwest Earth Institute. And I'd like to hear a little bit about you or learn a little, about, little bit about you. So um, we have a poll here, and you can see on slide three the, the instructions for the poll. Um, how familiar are you with Northwest Earth Institute's programs? You can press one on your keypad if you've participated in a Northwest Earth Institute discussion course. Press two on your keypad if you've participated in the Eco Challenge. Press three on your keypad if you've organized a discussion course or an Eco Challenge team and press four on your keypad if you haven't participated in any of Northwest Earth Institute's programs. So let's go ahead and do that now, and then I can get um, a poll from Caroline about uh, how familiar you are with our programs. And for those of you that may not be able to access a keypad, maybe you came on via Skype or something and it's difficult, that's fine. <laughs> um, you can certainly stay with us. And I just wanted to give uh, Lacey, the, the context, most people, um, Lacey, 36% don't, this is their first experience with Northwest Earth Institute, and 18% um, 
um, have had experience um, with the with Northwest Earth Institute programs, discussion guides, and and no one in the middle. So um, <laughs> that's who's on the call today. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. That gives me a little more context for the rest of the session. Um, I will Lacey, ask. Lacey, just let me remind people who might have come on late that the. Um, the handout Lacey was referring to, the slides, again, it's available on transitionus.org. If you don't have that uh, on the home page, you can go to the link for this event today, and there's a, a handout link. Um, and if you don't have that, you'll be able to follow along quite well without it. So go ahead, Lacey. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so as, as Caroline mentioned earlier today, this really is, this teleseminar is really kind of a taster of one of our discussion courses that um, we released in April of this year called Seeing Systems, Peace, Justice, and Sustainability. But first I'd like to give you just uh, some context about our programs, about our model for community building and transformative learning um, so that you can see that in practice in the rest of the session. Uh, the, the session itself is very different than the discussion courses because with a discussion course you have a group of, you know, 8, 12 people in a room together who are meeting on a regular basis. So there's lots of opportunity for conversation and not just one person facilitating. Um, but I'm going to try to use our own um, pedagogy in this, in this teleseminar and there will be opportunity for conversation um, a couple different times throughout. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about our model and then we'll get into the actual um, content of the session. Um, on slide four, you can see a very rudimentary diagram of our pedagogical process. And um, it's really centered around three different areas, connect, reflect, and act. And from the educational perspective, I call this shared discovery, personal reflection, and positive action. So the first one, connect, um, our discussion course programs, as well as the Eco Challenge, offer people an opportunity to get to know each other, to, to collaboratively construct knowledge with each other by telling each other about their own experiences, about, by discussing different articles that they've read or videos that they've watched or experiences that they might have had, and to be able to sort of fill in the gaps um, in their own knowledge as well as each person being an integral part to the process of discovery. Um, each person in a, in a discussion course or on an eco-challenge team has something very unique to offer the rest of the group, and the learning becomes richer and more enjoyable when we're doing it together. The second uh, circle there is personal reflection, and reflection is a very important part of our, our pedagogical process. We think it's important to learn new information, learn from each other, have new experiences, and then reflect on those new learnings or experiences to be able to apply it to our own lives and see um, how our, our lives could be changed or what our assumptions might be to be able to identify those invisible assumptions and make them visible and maybe transform them as well. And the third circle is positive action. So we want this process to lead to people being able to take actual um, physical or tangible action in their own lives and in their communities. Um, I think this is often a place where education in general uh, lacks. Uh, people, particularly with sustainability, will often feel very overwhelmed about the information that they're getting about climate change or pollution our food systems, and, uh, and it can just, it can lead to apathy. It can be so overwhelming that we don't know what we, we can do, and so we just don't do anything. We just shut it out. And so our process is really designed to get people to not feel like they can't do anything, to help people feel like they can make a difference, to figure out where they can make a difference, and then to have a, a community of support in making that difference. And that's really where our behavior change um, happens. So if I go to slide five, you can see our learning objectives for this session. They're pretty brief and they're focused around connect, reflect, and act. So the first one is to help everyone on the call make the connections between peace, justice, and environmental sustainability issues and solutions. And um, 
this is not assuming that you're not already doing that. I'm guessing if you're on this call, you probably are already doing that. But we'd like to be able to reinforce that um, in this connection with each other. Um, and we I would like to be able to do that um, with actually having some questions and conversation with you all um, pretty soon. The second learning objective is to introduce an offer opportunity for practicing systems thinking, so reflecting on on um, the assumptions about we that we have about the world and our place in it, um, and um, being able to to make some changes in that. And then three, to inspire participants and provide tools to take real action towards sustainable and holistic solutions in their communities. So I hope that this session in itself is something enjoyable that you learn something from it that you feel. Um, inspired in some way, but I also want to let you know about opportunities and tools for you to be able to take with you from the session and use if you feel like they might be useful in your neighborhood or in your um, particular context. So if we're going to start the session um, talking about peace, justice, and sustainability, um, those are some really big and unwieldy terms to use. So the next part of the, the session is to just um, have some working definitions that we can all know what we're talking about um, when we're talking about these things uh, during the, the conversation or during the conference today. So um, slide six has working definitions on it. The first one is systems thinking. So when I'm talking about systems thinking today, I'm talking about a way of approaching problems that focuses on how various elements within a system are related to and influence one another. So often in our world, we look at the pieces of a particular thing or a particular problem, um, but we fail to look at the ways that those pieces interact with each other, and that's a really important part of systems thinking. When I talk about peace, I'm not just talking about the, the uh, opposite of war. I'm talking about um, both a means of personal and collective ethical transformation and an aspiration to end human and inflicted destruction. So peace is both um, a means to nonviolence and an end being nonviolence itself. Justice is also one of those uh, one of those terms we use that can sometimes be a little cloudy. Here's a really basic just, uh, definition of justice. It's a concept of moral rightness. In this situation, in this um, teleseminar, we're talking about fair, reciprocal, and moral action or behavior. And sustainability, um, we use that term so often these days, and it means so many different things to so many different people. But um, for this particular teleseminar, sustainability is simply the ability to continue a defined behavior indefinitely, particularly a, a healthy and just life for, for everyone. So here's an opportunity for us to um, reflect and then share with each other. I have a question. In our discussion courses, the circle question is the very first question that we ask at the beginning of a session. Um, it would go around the room, and every person would just give a very brief answer without anyone responding. It's a way to get everyone's voices in the room and um, to kind of open us up to being able to talk and to listen to each other because in dialogue, listening is just as important as sharing your own opinion. So the question here is, looking at this definition of sustainability, what sustains you? And as a second kind of added question, I would say, what do you want to sustain? So let's take a few seconds to think about that. And then I will uh, call to see if anyone has any, anything that they would like to share with the group. So let's think about that. What sustains you? And or what do you want to sustain? So just uh, again, press one on your keypad. And I, I noticed Simon, you've you've you pressed one some time ago, and I apologize for us not having an opportunity. So this likely is not related, but I wanted to see if you had anything that you needed to say right now. Um, Simon, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. I actually think I meant to press four. Maybe. <laughs> that came oh, okay. Four. That was that I'm was while ago. Listening. But, Thank you. Yeah. Um, but but while we we've got you, is there anything that you could mention about sort of what sustains you, as Lacey asked? Or, um, and there aren't oh. scads of people on the call. This is a nice close group. So, 
Um, yeah. But, yeah, what sustained you and what, what would you like to see sustained? All right, well, um, what comes to mind uh, right off the top of my head is a healthy natural environment and um, a thriving social atmosphere as well, a thriving community. Yeah, I think those, I think it's, that's not too specific, <laughs> but um, that's what's immediately coming to mind. Yeah. And thanks for answering, uh, um, you know, right, right off, right off like that. Um, um, any, any other brave souls that there? Um, Barbara, go ahead. Um, Barbara. Sorry, I was on mute. Is that better? Yeah, that's, that's much better. <laughs> well, first I wanted to say thanks for inviting me on to this call. Um, I very much value the Northwest Earth Institute. And I like how you added the extra question about not only what sustains me, but what I want to sustain. And honestly, I, I thought about it, and, and I have one word that is answering both questions, and that is community. Mm. Um, community sustains me, and it's something that I want to help sustain. And I think Northwest Earth Institute courses are a great vehicle for that. Wonderful. And Barbara is not even a plant for this call. Now, um, <laughs> the, the discussion the discussion groups are really wonderful and and are a great way to start to knit community. Um, any other comments about again what sustains you and what you'd like? Um, to see sustained. And Lacey, at this point, um, we don't have any other hands going up. So back okay. to you. Thank you. And thank you, Simon and Barbara, for your answers. Um, I think it's so interesting. So many different times, or so many times we talk about sustainability, we're thinking about sustainability, um, it, that we're not really thinking about what we're wanting to sustain. And I think that um, it's interesting when you frame it that way, when you ask someone, everyone has something, well, I, I, wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't say everyone, most people have something that they know right off that they want to sustain or that sustains them. And um, I think this is an example of a question that you can ask a very mixed group of people. Um, it's a question that's not asking about the right answer, it's very personal but it allows people to connect with what they already value and what's important to them and then be able to share that with the group. And so everyone can find something that's important to them and it's always very enlightening to hear what sustains other people, what they want to sustain. So let's go to um, slide eight. Um, we'll start with a kind of bulk of the, of the uh, teleseminar today. Um, so systems thinking, it's all connected. Really a basic assumption of this session and of the course that it is taken out of is that we need to understand the connections. And so here on this slide, slide, um, slide eight, uh, you see two different models here. You see a, a kind of model of an ecosystem and then you see a model that's actually of a, a, um, how to frame sustainability. The first one I would say I'm using this model because um, if we're trying to identify our own assumptions about the world, this is the one that I have and the Northwest Earth Institute has. We see things, things from an ecosystem perspective. So um, seeing the connection, seeing how things are nested in, in um, other systems, seeing how systems interact with each, with each other, both are natural systems as well as the systems that humans have created. And seeing how each piece, each player has a particular role in that system um, is a very important part of how we view the world. And I think it's really important for you to know that up front. Uh, you see that on the, on the right hand side, there's a very, again, <laughs> very rudimentary <laughs> diagram. Um, but this is how we kind of frame sustainability. And there's so many different ways to do this. And I'm sure you've seen several of them. You might have your own favorite. And I think there, are, there is valid validity to all of them. But this is the one where, you use, where we see that the economy is a part of the society that we're a part of. And society is a part of the environment. And to really see human systems as a part of 
natural systems or being kind of um, enclosed in natural systems. And so that we see that these, that these circles, if you could maybe zoom in and actually look at um, better, uh, you could see that th these are all not, um, these circles aren't impenetrable, but they actually uh, allow for um, interaction among all the other parts. And so that we see that the economy affects society, society affects the environment, and vice versa. Um, so that there's there's interactions happening in all of these different layers. Um, go to slide nine now, and you'll see um, four different pictures. Uh, these are these are representing issues that we're currently facing in our world. So the first one represents war. Um, this is particularly a picture of Gaza from this summer. Um, that we're having all kinds of unrest throughout the throughout the world right now. Um, Syria, Iraq, Ukraine, Gaza. Some of these have been going on for generations. Um, and and while it might seem obvious how some things started, there's usually again generations of decisions and structures and trends that were contributing to what we see now um, at first. Or, the 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 events we're seeing um, today and what has played into it over over time. The uh, picture on the top right hand corner is actually a map of Ebola outbreaks in 2014. This is another example of something that's very big and complex, um, very widespread, and now particularly with um, uh, people who have Ebola being in the United States um, a little closer to home. Uh, we've had so many people infected by this disease, and we see that it's really complicated because a huge part of how diseases like this spread um, is because of uh, climate change, of, of animals moving into different parts of uh, continents that they haven't been in before, as well as uh, urbanization and humans spreading out into areas that they haven't really been a part of. So different animals and and parasites and bacteria and viruses all interacting with each other in new ways that they haven't really done before um, creates havoc in our human systems. The bottom left-hand picture is um, of the drought in California, which is um, in its third year now of being far more than what California usually, usually experiences. This is something that's affecting not just California, but the whole United States as far as um, produce prices increasing, um, so much of our produce, our nuts, um, are, are grown in California, and that's been, a f that's been felt uh, around the country, but also affecting agriculture and, in, and, um, and industry and the people who work in those areas, and, um, and people just who live in areas where there are drought. I was reading today um, for a New York Times article from last week where there's a whole valley of people who have not um, had access to running water for six months now because they live in rural areas, um, they aren't uh, connected to municipal water supplies, and they have wells that have, have dried up. So it's affecting people from a very local level to a national level. Um, and it's something that has been kind of in the works for a long time, the decisions that we've made. And then the right uh, bottom uh, corner, the photo there, um, is of protesters in Ferguson, Illinois, or Ferguson, Missouri, uh, which is actually, I'm in St. Louis now, so this is very close to home to me. Um, Mike Brown was an 18-year-old um, black uh, man who was shot and killed by a police officer in early August and um, has caused significant unrest in the community here not only for the injustice, injustice of his life being taken, but also because of the in-depth problems that that community has faced with racial discrimination, um, economic inequity, uh, lack of access to educational and uh, job resources, and um, feeling like no one really cares, that they've been continuing to face these problems and nothing has changed.
So these are four, just four examples of some really significant issues that are facing our world today. And they already seem complicated, but when you look at them from a systems thinking perspective, they can seem even more complicated, but it gives us some insight into all the different layers that make up um, the systems of our world and where we might be able to effectively intervene to make change. So slide 10 actually is a diagram of something called the iceberg. And it's a really effective tool for systems thinking. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, the very tip of the iceberg is the event, the thing that, that we see happening, the thing that's in the news, the thing that people get upset about. And the way that people interact in the system on that level is to react to whatever they're seeing, to whatever they're hearing about. Um, but as you can see, that's just a little bit of what's happening and what's underneath the waterline is everything that's been contributing to and building up to this event over time. So you can see patterns and trends um, that have happened that if we are trying to interact in the system, we can anticipate these patterns and trends. Um, you can see that below that, there are underlying structures that influence the patterns that allow the patterns to develop and continue. Um, and if we're trying to interact in the system on that level, we can design different structures, um, including policies, as well as uh, physical or interstructural um, structures. <laughs> Um, and then the bottom level is mental models. And this is the assumptions, beliefs, and values that we as the people hold about a system. Um, these are so invisible that we rarely realize that this is something that's underlying how we design structures and um, how trends and patterns happen. Um, but these, this is really critical. Um, if we're really wanting to transform a system, then we have to examine our mental models and um, sometimes deconstruct them, sometimes reinforce them, um, but be aware of what, what our mental models are that are um, kind of underlying everything else. So if we take this particular model, and ideally in a discussion course, we'd actually go through this as a group and talk about it. But if we look at this um, model and like kind of look at the other, at the issues that we were talking about earlier, we can see that there's so many different ways to intervene in a system, and no one of these is the only way to do it. The whole point of the system is that we need people intervening on every level of the system. So while we need people who are reacting to events that happen in order to be able to make change, we also need people who are anticipating patterns and trends, people who are designing different structures that lead to different patterns and trends, and people who are transforming helping us identify first our own assumptions about the world and then helping us transform those assumptions. So let's go back to those four different uh, issues that we were looking at before on slide 11. Um, a systems thinking approach to these problems recognizes that they all exist for similar reasons and that they're all affecting people in similar ways. In all of these situations, um, there is environmental degradation that's happening. There is economic inequality. There is violence. There is death. Um, that is happening as a result of badly designed systems or systems that interact with each other in ways that we weren't anticipating. And so a system solution would be able to look at all these different levels to be able to make change. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's pause a moment there. Does anybody have any questions about this model or something that they would like to share with the group? If you do, please press 1 on your keypad and Caroline will call on you. So again, um, any questions or comments sort of on looking at uh, that map, the iceberg, or looking at these, um, the sort of the interconnection of the different aspects that makes even a more complex uh, system? So 
press 1 on your keypad. And, you know, I encourage you to do so. We want to hear from you. So take, a, take the leap and uh, give us some of your thoughts. Uh, go ahead, Randy. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I just recently saw a chart that was put together by Lester Brown of the World Watch Institute that was entitled The Connectedness of World Problems. And it was the most overwhelming thing I've ever seen, but it really started at the very top. And of course, in a systems world, there is no top or bottom. But it started at the upper periphery, uh, and, it, and it started that the underlying problem for all of these problems was an outmoded uh, story, which goes something like this. We can have unlimited growth on a finite planet. And it traced, it traced this through every, uh, every uh, problem you can imagine, these four on the chart plus everything. And it finally what it led, led to was uh, 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 failed uh, nations and the unraveling of the social fabric. And so I, I just uh, reconfirming the picture we have here and, uh, and what Lacey's talking about, that there are a lot of different people uh, uh, seeing those connections. And finally, it, it really is all connected. Just confirm that. Oh, good. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And um, any anyone else um, has a resource like that or comment or, or thought, um, press 1 on your keypad. And um, seeing no more right now, Lacey, um, I'm going to turn it back okay. over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Randy. Um, I think that that's, that's sometimes, I think what particularly as humans, maybe particularly as Western hemisphere humans, we want um, things already so, seem so complicated. We want someone to tell us what the answer is. We want an easy answer. We want the, the cure-all or the 10-step program. And I think <clears throat> systems thinking doesn't allow that for us, but it allows the opportunity for creating a new world, create the world we want to see, the sustainability that we envision. <laughs> and I am so sorry, I'm coughing again. Um, there, um, there's a, a book called Leadership Without Easy Answers that, um, by Ronald Heifetz. It's, um, I think it was from 2006. And he talks about the difference between technical problems and adaptive challenges. And I think so often the way that we kind of approach these issues is for these technical problems. We say, um, here's the scientific fix, or here's the technological fix, or here's this one thing that we need to do to change the world. So a good example of this is, oh, we're, uh, oil is polluting and we're going to run out of it. And so the, solu the solution is nuclear power, or the solution is solar power. And what we end up doing when we create these, when we create these kind of technical fixes is that we create new problems that might be just as bad or worse than the ones we had to begin with. And Heifetz talks about adaptive challenges being seeing that issues are not just scientific or technological, that they're cultural, and being able to root in that culture. Just as Randy was saying, seeing the story or changing the story um, so that we can sort of interact and kind of have feedback loops and see how our interactions affect the system and kind of do um, really small changes. Um, or to be able to do big changes, but not to expect it to be a cure-all, that it really requires changing our culture. So I really like that what you, what you said about stories, and Buster Brown has some really good stuff to say about that as well. Um, so we're kind of looking at these huge, huge issues. And um, I like to kind of take it down to something really specific, environmental justice, which is still itself a huge issue. Um, but if you go to slide 12, you'll actually see um, a quote by Aldo, Aldo Leopold. So most of you probably know, but Aldo Leopold wrote a Sand County Almanac in 1949. And in it, he puts forth the idea of a land ethic. And he says that a land ethic is simply enlarging the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. So what Leopold is calling for in a San County Almanac was really new at the time. Well, 
<laughs> new for modern culture, not new for indigenous peoples or for ancient cultures. But this idea of that the community, um, as, as um, was mentioned earlier, community is something that sustains us and that we sustain, but kind of enlarging that idea of community to include the whole land. And I think for someone who is who has been involved in kind of traditionally environmental work, it's, it's really easy for people kind of in my circle to enlarge their idea of community to include other, other organisms or the land, but it's sometimes harder to enlarge our, our idea of community to include people who are different than us, who look different than us, who have different experiences than us, who live in different places than us. And what I see is, environmental justice is saying, hey, we're going to enlarge the community to include all the people as well as the whole ecosystem. So you can see on slide 13, there's another quote about the land ethic. That land as a community is the basic concept of ecology, but the land is to be loved and respected as an extension of ethics. I love these quotes from uh, Leopold's book, and if you haven't read a Sand County Almanac, I highly encourage you to do so. It's really beautifully written, and I always feel like I learn something new every time I read it. But I really like the idea of applying these quotes to something being that the land includes all of us, people and, um, and plants and animals and, and the community of life that, that exists around us. And I think for environmental justice also has a very strong rooting in the idea of ethics and relationship. And then slide 14. We can be ethical only in relation to something we can see, feel, understand, love, or otherwise have faith in. And that's, I think, really a very inspiring idea that what we're trying to preserve is something, um, what we're trying to sustain or to preserve or however you want to look at it is something that we really believe in, something that's meaningful to us, something that we care about. And a community is, uh, is making sure that the whole land, that um, all of our ecosystems are part of those things that we care about. On slide 15, you can see the EPA's definition of environmental justice. Um, it's the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. While a very thorough definition, it's not quite as poetic as, uh, as Leopold's idea of the land ethic, but I think it's important for us to see this and to be able to see the connections between the two. Um, environmental justice is fair tre treatment and meaningful involvement. So no particular people has to share or should be able or should have to bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences that result from the systems that we have in place or the policies that we have in place. And every person who is affected should be able to have a meaningful involvement um, both in decisions that affect themselves as well as the public's contribution um, their contribution can influence um, different agencies' decisions. Their concerns are considered in decision-making processes, and decision-makers seek out and facilitate the involvement of those who are potentially affected. Um, so I want to see kind of both of these somehow melded together so we have really thorough, um, helpful definitions like the, the EPA's definition of environmental justice but we also have this really inspiring, poetic, meaningful, ethical framework for environmental justice as well. Um, and a really good example of this, um, something that's been in the news currently, something that I'm sure you all have been considering, um, I've been considering for years, is climate change. Um, climate change is a great example of an issue that brings together um, peace and justice and sustainability as well as the absence of all of those. Um, with climate change, we see environmental degradation. We see um, entire ecosystems or biotic communities being detrimentally affected by warmer weather or rising oceans or ocean acidification. Um, we see people affected by this. We see climate refugees, people who have to leave the communities that they have lived in 
because their house is underwater or they no longer have access to clean water or food resources. Um, and this is happening all over the world, not just in places like Africa or the Philippines, but here in the U.S. Um, with the people who were uh, kind of forced out of their areas because of Hurricane Sandy and Katrina, um, or people like right now in California who are dealing with this drought and don't really have any options of where they can go. Climate change makes resources scarcer for all of us, and all of this contributes to unrest, um, including um, not just war, but um, people having fear of what might be happening to them and, and acting out of that fear. So while this shows kind of the negative consequences of our actions, there are also so many opportunities for creating peace for creating a living peace that is just and environmentally sustainable. And there's so many opportunities to interact in many di different levels in the system, from changing our ideas about the, um, the, idea that the, the assumption that we should all be able to drive whenever we want to in our own personal cars, um, or that we need industry in the way that it currently exists, or that certain companies are too big to fail as well as in our local communities and the decisions we make in urban planning, um, the decisions that we make in how we interact in our communities and who should be at the table when we're making decisions about uh, climate change or uh, our responses to it. If you see slide 19, um, I would say that co-creating living peace um, is all about action, and these are all verbs. So um, peace is, um, we need to, is about behavior. We need to practice peace. Um, we need to engage with our environment, including people, places, and things to create peace. We need to allow for differences and different perspectives and realize that those actually enrich our understanding um, of how the world works and what our place is in it. We need to create and seek out opportunities to build peace. And we can emerge transformed as a peace opportunist. And I like this idea of a peace opportunist, <laughs> finding ways to create peace wherever we are, to recognize that those of us who are involved in um, anti nuclear disarmament campa campaigns, and those of us who are involved in climate change initiatives, and those of us who are involved in making sure that um, land cells get cited in appropriate areas or that uh, make sure that our communities are economically just for everyone who's involved, that there are workers' rights and that there are um, humane, humane um, human rights considered in everything that we do. All of us are working actually on the same, in the same projects. We're finding different ways to interact in the system, but we're all working to make the world a better place for us all. Um, so keep in mind those, those verbs in what you're doing in your own work. I'd like to share a few stories of people I know who are co-creating Living Peace. These are people who are in our network, um, people who have been involved in our programs. And um, I know there's so many out there, and I would love to hear some of your stories. But um, let me just tell you a few of these. The first one here is Friends of North Creek Forest. This is a group in Bothell, Washington. And they were a neighborhood group that started out doing our Discovering a Sense of Place discussion course together. They loved the course so much, and they loved their interactions with each other that they kept on meeting for three, three years after the course got over. Um, they did various Northwest Earth Institute discussion courses. And they were trying to figure out how to really interact in a positive way in their community. Um, they decided they wanted to do something tangible in the community. And so um, there was this 64-acre urban forest um, throughout their city. And it was uh, slated for development. This group of folks got together. They worked for the city. They wrote grants. And so far, they have um, been able to, to get the city to buy and preserve 41 acres of a 64-acre urban forest. Um, 
to be used as uh, environmental education, as a wildlife corridor, as a place where people can go to relax and to commune with nature. And it was just a group of people who got together and then made a big difference in their area. The second um, picture there is of ECOVA. Um, ECOVA is a total energy and sustainability management company. Um, they offer resource consumption reporting and efficiency consulting services. <clears throat> so they have uh, over 1,500 employees throughout the U.S. Um, but last year, about 250 of their employees participated in the Eco Challenge. And you can see in that picture a little tree they made where people were posting what they were going to be doing for the Eco Challenge. And this was something that, while they didn't do something big within the company, the company created a culture of sustainability on a network of support so that people could share their individual actions with each other, feel inspired, get to know each other in new ways, and then um, be more engaged at work as a result of that commitment to each other and to, um, to sustainability. The third picture there is of Judy Alexander. Um, and Judy Alexander uh, was one of the founders of Jefferson County Earth Institute, which is a partner organization of Northwest Earth Institute. Um, she lives in Port Townsend, Washington, and she's active in both Northwest Earth Institute programs and transition initiatives. Um, Judy is a wonderful person, and she has done some amazing work in her community. She's helped to organize over 150 Northwest Earth Institute discussion courses with over 800 participants just in her small community. And I think that Port Townsend is a town of like 10,000 people, so that's really significant. She was also instrumental in getting uh, farmers and restaurant owners, um, farmers markets, and citizens together to talk about and uh, take action around creating more local and sustainable food options in Jefferson County. Um, and in fact, actually, there's um, groups in both Ohio and Vermont that have used her organization strategies as a model for their own community initiatives. And then the last picture here is um, of Vestas which is a, a wind energy company. Um, it's an international wind turbine manufacturer. In 2011, 12 employees from the branch in Portland uh, participated in, on our Sustainable Systems at Work discussion course. So the group was so inspired by the program that they wanted to be able to take um, tangible action in their organization. So um, they came up with a couple different ideas. They narrowed it down, and they decided that one key project for them was to reduce waste in, the, in their organization. So they started a blue tarp project. And um, the tarps, when the wind, wind turbines are shipped, there's tarps on either end to prevent dust and stuff like that from blowing in. And those tarps were, um, they're really heavy, like high, high quality waterproof materials. Um, but they were being ripped off and, and most of them were being landfilled after just one use. And so the blue tarp project, redesign the tarps to be reusable so they can be zipped on and off over and over again, um, saving thousands of yards of this high quality fabric. Um, on anything that becomes unusable is made into a durable waterproof bag by Looped Works, which is a Portland-based upcycling company. So not only did they find something significant in their organization that they could change, but they also ended up partnering with someone else who was wanting to make change um, and creating a really cool partnership out of it. I love these stories. I think, Randy, when you talked about stories, stories are why I keep doing what I do. I can be overwhelmed by what I'm learning about in the world and figuring out how to make change. But then I hear about individuals, just like all of you, who are working in whatever context they're in, whether they're in a neighborhood group or in a, in a business or um, faith community or wherever it might be, finding ways to make changes in their own lives their families and their communities um, and then and then bigger and bigger and I love um, being able to meet these people and hear about their stories and share our own stories with each other so I guess I want to leave you with one commitment to action find one thing that you want to commit to to be able to make change and go figure out how to do it um, two things that we offer you to help you do that our, our Eco Challenge, which is starting in just a few days, and our discussion courses. If you'd like to learn more about them, please go to our website, or you can email me at Lacey, L-A-C-Y, at nwei.org, and I'd be happy to tell you about them.
I don't in any way think that you need our programs to be able to make change in your communities. I'm sure you're doing that already. But I think these are really effective tools. And as you've heard from some other people on the line, um, they really are amazing at being able to create community with each other and uh, find a way to support each other to take action. Um, so if you think they would be helpful for, to you, I really would love to offer you uh, the opportunity to try it. Um, we actually have a discount code um, and a free sampler of our Seeing Systems Peace, Justice, and Sustainability discussion course. For those of you on the call who might be interested, um, just let me or Caroline know if you'd like um, to, to get that, um, those things that we're offering to you. Um, the discount code is for 10%, but you can use it on uh, one book for yourself or if you're wanting to uh, buy several books for, for organizing a course. Um, and uh, slide 22, I'm sure you've probably seen this comic before, but it's one of my favorites because we're looking at all of this and we're saying, seeing how complex it is. But what the, what's the alternative? Not doing something that's better for ourselves, that's better for our children, that creates better jobs and clean air and, and water and healthy communities. Um, really, the alternative doesn't even compare to what we can do to make a, to make a positive difference in the world, regardless of, of what are <clears throat> the issues that we do face. So like right now, uh, we have about um, 15 minutes left. Um, are there any questions or comments would you like to discuss as a group? Um, you can ask me, or if there's just something that you would like to share that's relevant to what we um, went over today, I would love to hear from you. And you can press one on your keypad. Caroline will call on you. Yeah, first off, um, Lacey, I just want to thank you. And just again, I, I do appreciate the stories, and it's those stories that can really inspire us into new action. So thanks for sharing that and, and your great resources and just reminding people that the Eco Challenge, there is no cost. And even the idea of discussion groups, too, um, I think it's a really great, great way to get people started and get them in action. So I just love what you're doing and Transition US is a big fan and supporter. So so thanks thanks for everything. And thank again, you. Just, yeah, you're so welcome. And again just pressing one on your keypad, um, if you have any further comments or other resources or thoughts or concerns or if you want to share an action that you might want to engage in, um, let us know. And it looks like we've got a pretty quiet group here, Lacey. No one's putting up their <laughs> hand. Um, okay. So we, we, we can end early, which is lovely. And just wanted to invite you to make any closing comment. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you all very much for participating. Um, I know it can be kind of strange to share your personal thoughts on a call, but if you have anything that you would like to ask questions about or to follow up on, please feel free to call me or email me. Um, my, my email again is lacy, L-A-C-Y at nwei.org. My phone number is 618-694-4688, or you can go to our website or call our main office in Portland. Um, I love what that, what's happening with um, people who are involved in transition in initiatives. I love that we want to take action in our local communities to make change. And I'm really excited to be able to have been involved with you all um, in this teleseminar. So thank you for the inspiration that you offer me. And um, that's all. I guess we'll close for now. So thank you. And Lacey and all the participants, thank you so much for joining us today and hope to um, further our work together with all of these great innovative ideas. So um, until next time, again, thank you so much. Thank you.